All right, everybody, welcome to Oregon State University Permaculture Design Pro. This is the spring and summer 2023 class. It's great to have everybody here live and everybody else who's going to be here or watching this after the fact. Um, these office hours are an opportunity for you folks to ask questions and to first to have a conversation. Uh, what's going on? I'm just going to mute folks. Thanks so much. Um, so I will put the question and answer doc into our chat, just so that way, if anybody wants to use it to ask questions, they can. So I'll put that in there if people haven't seen it yet. And I'll just ask everyone to mute yourself um, till we get to any questions. So a couple things to talk about. First and foremost, my name is Javin Bernakovic. I own and operate All Points Design. That's allpointsdesign.ca. And since 2009, I've been working in regenerative land design and education. This has allowed me to work and visit places like Uganda and Kenya and Cuba and to work remotely all over the world. I've had clients from uh, all continents and have worked on small and large scale projects. So I've worked on things like backyards and balconies and uh, recently worked on a 6,500 hectare farm. And uh, I love doing this work. It's something that really excites me and it allows me to give back to the world, I think, in a positive way. Um, about 10 years ago, I started working with uh, life design, this concept of how do we how do we create a life that's worth living? How do we have a sense of our essence? And how do we have that be an expression through our work and through what we do? And so life design has been a huge component of my work because when we get to land design, a lot of people think they know what they want or they watch a video or they watch a YouTube, um, uh, largely as, as many people have found this course through uh, Andrew Millison's work, which is phenomenal. Um, but Taking a look at what other people have doesn't give us a sense of what we may be either wanting or what might be very useful for us. So life design has been a really important piece of that. And um, I've curated a process called values-based decision-making, allowing us to think what are the values we want to hold in the future and then how can we get there? And I do this with all my clients. So right now I'm working on about 150 acre homestead and I actively ask my clients and work on their values to make sure that we find and fit all of the design elements to their values. Um, last year or two years ago, I started regenerative living online, which is a uh, really interesting step into the online education space because I was seeing a lot of people becoming recalcitrant and polarized and kind of in their corners. And so I wanted to create a place where we could learn skills, practical skills to live on the planet as if we want to stay without becoming or deifying these different elements. So you'll find I'm a lowercase p permacultural user. Um, I think of it as a tool in my toolbox. It's not everything. And uh, when somebody comes to design your home or build your home uh, and they pull out a hammer, we don't get all excited, excited saying they're a hammerist. They just they have a hammer and they're using it. So similarly, I don't look at permaculture as being everything that I do. It's a tool in my toolbox, and I'm a regenerative land designer. And permaculture is one of these great tools, very adaptive, that I use on a daily basis, not only in my design work, but also in my daily life. Um, I, up until a year ago, was stewarding about 400 acres, um, working, uh, working it mostly as a homestead. And then my family and I decided to move to Ecuador for a year to try it out and see what it's like. So it's nice to be back in a tropical environment. Um, for those of you that don't know about Canada, it's cold and it's cold for a long time. So I'm really enjoying not being so cold anymore. So thanks so much for everybody to sh who showed up today. That's great. I'm going to start going through our, um, our Q&A doc. I've got a couple of lists here and I haven't seen any questions at the bottom. So just going to keep going. And if anybody has a question, feel free to put it into the chat or put it into the question and answer doc. So one of the things I wanted to point out is this idea of gauging success. So let's kind of distance ourselves from the world for a second and think about the fact of what is success for us in this course. Now, for me, I want you to be introduced to these topics. I want you to deeply contemplate and be critical of these topics and apply yourself to design as much as possible. 
I don't care about the marks. <laughs> I'll say it up front. Yes, it's put on by university, but I don't care about the marks. So the marks for me, the grades are a guide to help you, A, do everything in the rubric, B, show that your designer's mind is starting to, to come through those design and see that it's rendered in such a way that it's legible. There's a fair amount of design that becomes problematic if it's not legible. So you'll find that I'll talk a lot about legibility within design work. Um, I heard this today and I love it. Oops is the sound that progress makes. Enjoy your mistakes and it's a wonderful place to make them. So this course is a wonderful place to make your mistakes. Out in the real world is a more problematic place to make your mistakes. It'll happen regardless. But having your mistakes in this environment with your peers, with me, allows you to make them freely, quickly, and to let them go as quickly as possible. You'll find that the permaculture design template, which um, was a bit of my brainchild over the last couple of years, is a collation of everything that I've seen in the over um, 65 uh, PDCs that I've run and been a part of. So it's my intent that you use the portfolio. You can change it and work with it and all the rest of it, but it's made in such a way and it's made in such a scale that you can print it out. And so you can use it directly as a design process or template in your work if you decide to go into this afterwards. Um, some of you will have problems and frustrations with Google Slides. And I get that. It's not a perfect tool. It's not a perfect application, but it's a free application that's accessible to everybody. So what I would recommend is if you don't like drawing your maps or using Google Slides to make your maps, which is totally fine, use whatever you're familiar with. If you don't know how to use a design program or software yet, just use Google Slides or use pencil and paper. So I use pencil and paper still up to about six years ago, and I still make sketches. These days, I mostly do it digitally via a graphic tablet. I use an iPad. But basically, we want, it, we want you to develop the understanding of putting things in a space, in a place, in a plan view, in a cross-section view, and if you want, in a perspective render that allows you to look at these elements and go, yes, this is where this is. And then a client or a colleague could look at it and go, yes, this element is here. So however you get there is fine. You don't have to work with the tutorials or the templates, but there it is there for you to, to use. You'll find that each week, which is called a lesson in our uh, discussion page, um, has a number of assignments under it. So this is one of the mistakes that people have been making uh, as of late is that when they get to our area here, so I'm just going to move a couple things around in the Zoom so I can see what I'm doing. And you'll find that there's pin, dis dis uh, pin discussions up top. So right at the top, we've got our office hours. Then there's an open discussion. So if anybody has something they want to talk about that isn't necessarily related to a subject or a topic, or they just want to share a conversation, that's a great place to put it. Then we'll have our uh, lesson. And then basically, as the lessons come up, I will pin them up here. And we'll have a chance to work on them and go through them. So basically, once you get to this discussion page, you'll see the assignments that are up here. You'll see that there's a personal survey assignment, a design assignment, and a climate survey. So just make sure that when you submit, you have all of those assignments complete. Um, I, I'm not going to mark partial uh, lessons or partial weeks that, that don't have everything in them. Uh, so just make sure that all of these are together. So basically, you'll see in the template, if you haven't gone through it already, up top are tutorials. On the right and left are elements. Anything in blue is basically a prompt or instructions. Anything in, in yellow is what you need to replace with your own content and information. Um, so we've got these three here. We've got personal survey, then design site, and then climate survey. So all of those should be done when you're finished. And then when you're ready to submit, just make sure to click on this first week's assignment. So it's this slide here, and make sure to triple click this URL and copy that. And this is all in the tutorials, but we wanna make sure that you go directly to uh, the right slide because I have, I'm managing roughly 90 students. And so I need to have all these quick places to get myself to as we go through. Okay, going back to my notes. Uh, okay, yeah, so resubmission. What you'll find is that I usually give video feedback. This allows me to give a lot of feedback in a short amount of time. It also allows me to draw on your slides. So if I'm seeing something specific or if I'm seeing potentially another design, I can draw on your slides and kind of show you what I'm thinking. Um, 
this means that sometimes there will be elements that were missing and you can resubmit and you can resubmit as, as much as you want. I want you to learn. I want you to grow. So again, I don't care about the marks. I don't care about the grades. I want you all to get 100%. So resubmission is encouraged. And basically, you'll just resubmit under your initial uh, submission. Um, have fun with the assignments. Uh, if you hold these things too tightly, they become frustrating. And uh, make sure to dialogue with your fellow students. You are required to give two peer reviews uh, during each week or each lesson. But if, you, if you're reading somebody's assignment and you really like what's going on and you want to share resources or have conversations, that's one of the great things about my group is that I take Canadian students, or I take Canadian students, cold climate students, and international students because I've worked internationally and I work in metric, as most of the world does. So there's a great opportunity to reach out and learn about different people. We talked about rendering, so don't obsess about rendering. Uh, site selection. So this is something that we do have in the course, but I found over the last couple of years, people have kind of missed. You need to visit your site multiple times throughout the course. If you can't visit your site, you should probably choose a new site. Because you need to go and you need to do observations about uh, vegetation, because you need to go and take samples for soil, because you need to go and take heights for different uh, elements in your site, it's really important to be able to get to your site. So if you can't visit your site, I would suggest switching it. Also, um, if your site is massive, this may not be the right scope and size to start this course with. That's a lot to design. So some people will bring like hundreds of acres to design. My recommendation is to find a smaller area within that bigger design and have that as your design site. Uh, what you want to do is you want to learn through this process. You don't necessarily want to take on an opus of a design site that for most designers would take a huge amount of time and effort. So just be conscientious about the size. One of the very first questions in that personal survey, oh, I just had a question from Cotiano. How big can the site be or how small is small? Yeah, so it can be any size you want. Um, but basically, you want to be able to work on a size that feels accomplishable. So I've had people who have been in Hong Kong and Malaysia and London who've done a balcony, which is only like four feet by 12 feet because that's all they had. So basically, we designed intensive urban stacked planters with composting underneath that were wicking beds that captured a little bit of the rainwater over top because they made an awning. And I've had people who are skilled and have some experience in land design or are ranchers or farmers take their entire farm or their homestead and work on it. So I would say if you're looking at it and you're feeling overwhelmed as a design site, make it smaller. Um, understandably, I think if you're looking at uh, a balcony and if that's all you have, that's fine. Or if you're, if you're trying to design a small courtyard garden, that's fine as well. I think all of those are, are, are totally fine. Totally fine. Um, Francis Wang, uh, question. Dow mentioned in discussions that I should ask the instructor perhaps to use a farm I'm purchasing as design site, but do the soil samples at my home. I live one hour away. Is that okay or should I just do my backyard? You could do either. Yeah, you could do either. So kind of a couple options there. If you're thinking of purchasing this farm and you want to use the course to help kind of evaluate it and design it and think about it, that would be great. Ideally, if you could go to the farm and say, hey, I'm taking this course and I'd like to kind of do the assignments there, you could take soil samples there. Or what you could do, and this is what a lot of people have to do in the winter in temperate climates, is they'll take soil samples from someplace and they'll make believe that that soil sample is from a place that they would want it to be on the farm. So the way the soil assignment would work is you would still make your map for your for the, the pre-purchased farm and you would have a couple of areas that you would want to test anyways. And then you would just grab some other soil and you would make believe that it was there. So you could do either, but I think the most value would be go to the farm if you can, take the soil samples from there. Less valuable would be use the farm as your site, take soil samples from your backyard. Um, and I guess third, less valuable would be like just find soil from anywhere because at least then you're getting a little bit of conversation about your backyard. Um, and if you do, if if it's like, if you don't think you're actually going to, be purchasing the farm, I'd probably just go with the backyard. Great questions. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so yeah, back to expectations. So after my first PDC, which is in 2009, it took roughly three to five years to feel confident about designing for other people. Uh, I think because of this course, the template, and hopefully a little bit of mentorship from me coming from what I found from previous students, um, 
Some students have been able to get into design immediately after the course, which is pretty rare. You have to come with a pretty healthy skill set and understanding. If you've never planted a tree, you're not really eligible to plant a tree after this course because it is an online course. We can describe lots of things, but until you put your hands on a tree and understand the root ball, the crown, the stem, planting distance, planting sizes, which we'll get into, it's hard uh, to be eligible for that. And when I was teaching in person and we were doing two week intensives, which is another way of taking a PDC, which is like drinking from a fire hose. Uh, some people love it. Uh, some people love being into uh, an immersive experience and all the rest of that. I can't say I retained a lot from that first PDC, but it was intensive. Um, once you've had that first PDC, you have a little bit of ability, a little bit of comprehension, a little bit of aspect. It took me three and a half years to become good. So I, you can expect after this course that there are some things you'll be eligible for, for, eligible for, and there will be some things you are not eligible for. If you've never planted a tree, you're probably not eligible to create uh, a food forest. And when I used to teach these two weeks intensive, there would always be a group of young men who were like, we're going to make a food forest company. We're going to food forest the world. And I'd always have to ask them, have you planted a tree before? Have you run a business before? Um, do you have any other experience beside these two weeks? And they'd always be like, no, but we can do it. And almost without exception, they would come back within a year and be like, can we get some help? <laughs> because they just weren't eligible. So just be realistic with your expectations. Uh, I was almost a financial advisor. I got my securities ticket, my insurance ticket years ago. And one of the things that we realized in debt reduction is to do what's called a snowball method, where you pay down the debt that's most easily available to pay down, or you have success early on. And this is really important with anything we learn. Work on things that can create success so that way you can move up. If you take on something too big and you fail, it can be hard to start again. So just be conscientious about that. Uh, David Shaw, yeah, a PDC is a great place to start, but a terrible place to stop. So hopefully this is the beginning of your ecological or regenerative land design conversations. And hopefully you take other PDCs from local or international individuals that can help round out the conversation because there's always going to be different things you take from different permaculture design courses. Again, permaculture is a tool in your toolbox. It's not a religion, but some people like to deify it. Um, it isn't the solution to the world's woes, but man, is it a great start. And uh, for me, when I, when I was first sitting in my first PDC in 2009, and I was given the prime directive of permaculture, which is to take responsibility for ourselves and for that of our children. And I heard what, what was originally the three ethics, which have changed, which is take care of the planet. It's our first investment. It's our, it's our only asset. Take care of the people. That's how we interact and, and access that asset and each other, and then set limits to consumption and redistribute the surplus. I remember shaking and raising my hand and the teacher calling on me and I was like, I was, I was blown away. This is something that I could work with for years because it's such a big umbrella. There are so many disciplines within it that you can play for years. I've been able to go into rainwater harvesting and soil creation and full landscape design and homestead design and pre-purchase pre property assessment. There's so much you can do within this from uh, not only a, a standpoint of a field that you want to pursue, but also from a business perspective. And it's one of those things that I've specialized in is helping people to create businesses. So how to succeed in this course? Ask for help. So if you're stuck on something, reach out. Feel free to email me, javin at allpointsdesign.ca. Uh, that gets to me quicker than the Canvas email, and I check it daily. And reach out. If you have a problem, if there's an issue, reach out. But watch the tutorials first and read through the materials. The amount of people that come and ask for questions. I'm like, have you watched the tutorials? And they haven't. And so it's, I'm just showing, I'm, I'm doing the tutorial again, which I'm happy to do. If anybody has a problem, reach out to me. I'll jump on Zoom. We'll make sure that we resolve the problem quickly. So that can be anything from like technical details or otherwise. Dow runs a great discussion, um, a discussion page on Canvas for anybody who's having technical details or issues to so take a look at that. Um, yeah, so there's this idea of working on developing your designer's mind, like seeing things differently. And so sometimes thinking is actually the most important thing we can do. It's not actually about putting things on the page. And this is why we want to make sure that the rendering is as simple as possible. There's this wonderful conversation in permaculture called the burden is on the designer. And so when we are designing, when we are putting uh, elements into our space, when we're suggesting plants, when we're suggesting water harvesting, 
the burden of what those ecological, those abiotic and biotic, those living and non-living elements, what that does in a landscape is our responsibility. And this is where I think permaculture and other types of applications can create bad actors, people who think, well, if I just swale everything, then it'll be fine. Any one of these elements not in their appropriate place can become a problem, not just for you, but for multiple people for years to come. There was a, a permaculture student that uh, was taught by Jeff Lawton and, and Bill Mollison when he was still alive, came back to Canada and just started installing ponds willy-nilly all over the country. And a number of them got stop orders. A number of them got cease and desist orders. A number of them had to remediate the pond because they didn't look at the local regulations. So for me in land design, there's these three big circles that overlap. One is the inherent characteristics of the landscape. So what does the landscape actually want to do and be and grow? Years ago, I got asked to take a look at this bison farm. And uh, I, was, I was with a friend of mine and I was just with her and we stopped at this bison farm. She was picking up some cheese, some meat, pardon me. And uh, the guy had seen some YouTube videos of me or a podcast don't quite remember. And he said, hey, would you mind taking a look at this area of my land? I, I want your opinion. I was like, sure. So we walked over and he had these fields and pastures. And then he had this wetland that was coming through, snaking a little creek. And he said, uh, okay, so what I want to do is I want to turn this all into pasture. Like, like, tell me what I think, tell me what you think I should do. I was like, okay, fine. So for about 15 minutes, I walked the land and I came back and he came and I was like, you're not going to like my answer, but here's what it is. This landscape was a wetland before there were animals or humans here. It was a wetland while there were animals and humans, and it'll be a wetland after animals and humans are gone. You should work with this wetland. You should work with this waterscape, and you should probably put in um, tree fodder, tree crops, tree hay, things that the, the bison can eat, things that you can eat, and you should probably repair this riparian area. And he looked at me and he goes, that's the smartest thing that over five different consultants and $10,000 over five years has guarded me. And he told me that the last guy said he should rip off the topsoil, go down to parent material, fill in the wetland and put everything on top. One thing that permaculture does really well is looks like opens up the blinders and says, oh, wait a second, this little landscape is in a watershed and this watershed is in a climate zone and this climate zone is in a regulatory area. So that first circle, inherent characteristics, is what the land actively wants to be. And we'll do a lot of assessment of your land to get a sense of what does the land actually want to be. That next circle is the client's wants, needs, budget, and ability. So some clients don't know what they want, don't know what they need, don't know what they're going for. And so part of the evaluation process is to draw that out of them so you can understand how these two circles interact. Because... A lot of the times what a client wants doesn't overlap with what a landscape can give. So this is where things like values-based decision-making are so useful and why when I design, my first stage of design is called a feasibility study because most people watch these, these documentaries like Biggest Little Farm or these other documentaries where somebody gets an angel investor of an undisclosed amount of money, which if you haven't watched Biggest Little Farm, it's about a family and a farm that creates a a uh, regenerative landscape, the higher permaculture consultant. Uh, but for those of us that are in the know and watch this movie and are consultants, we figure they got somewhere between five and $8 million to do what they did, um, which they don't disclose that. So it takes a fair amount of time. So understanding what a client wants and what overlaps with their intrinsic characteristics is really important. And then this last circle, which nobody talks about, is regulatory issues. What are you allowed to do with the regulations that are there? In Kenya, we can redig up the road and we can catch water off the road and drive it directly into our landscape with zero problem. Easy to do. In Canada, you will have at least five or six bylaw officers and probably a cop show up if you decide to remove the pavement. That being said, there are people like Brad Lancaster down in Tucson, Arizona, which have created things like curb cuts where they take the water that comes down the gutter puts it into a series of trees and then returns it back down the road. So there's always this thing called civil courage that we're going to play with if we decide to play in the world of regenerative land design. And civil courage means what battle do you want to fight with regulatory um, authorities? Uh, or what 
battle do you want to avoid or just simply try to seek permission from? I'm not telling you what to do. I'm saying these are the areas and the aspects you need to think about as a designer. So again, those three circles, intrinsic characteristics, what the client's needs and wants are. And then the last one is regulatory issues. So this next point, ask questions. We talked about that. And then if you want, this is the great thing about this, this group is that you can reach out to somebody in a like-minded climate or like-minded size of a property or maybe in the same location and getting a study buddy uh, every single course I've been in, personally as a student, uh, for at least the last 20 years, I've always reached out to somebody else in the course being like, hey, do you want to be study buddies? We'll meet halfway in between assignments or halfway between elements. Let's chat about this. Let's talk about this. Let's have somebody to share this enthusiasm with. The reason for this is that your friends or your significant other will listen to you go on and on and on about these things because they're very exciting to us. But Having somebody who's also invested in the course so you can have a back and forth with is really phenomenal. So I would highly recommend as you get through assignment one and kind of read the personal surveys and read the design sites, there's somebody who's like-minded, just reach out and be like, hey, do you want to be study buddies and get together maybe like once every other week, like in between the lessons and uh, the submission dates and chat about what's going on and share and all the rest of that, or create a study group, you know, a regional study group. It can be something that's really useful. Okay, final due date. So this is important. You can be up, you can be as late as you want, actually. Um, I don't recommend it. It puts a lot of pressure on you when you are developing and designing and working your uh, assignments. But you can be a couple of weeks late. If you are moving to the two the three weeks late uh, conversation, you probably won't receive a huge amount of feedback or sometimes not at all from me. Uh, but you will still receive your marks and you will still will receive um, the grading. But as we move further into the course, and especially when we get to the break, if you're not keeping up with those assignments by break, you'll probably want to think about re-enrolling or you'll want to be thinking about if you actually want to continue with the course. And some people just decide not to get their certificate, which is fine. Uh, honest confession, no one's asked for my PDC certificate in... 15 years, not one person, nobody cares. <laughs> Every once in a while you find a UN job or uh, a, a USAD job or like a local company that's doing uh, like landscaping work and you want to be their their new hire, their new ecological, and they ask for a PDC. I haven't heard of anybody who actually asked for their certificate. So if you get to the middle of the course and you're feeling overwhelmed and life happens and things happen and it does, um, you may decide you just don't want to get the certificate and just go through the course as you can. Um, I will be there for feedback up until the end of the course. And then after that, you're on your own, but you will have lifetime access to the course. So as long as the internet and OSU is an institution, you'll have access. And if it's not, your permaculture skills will probably become very useful and valuable. But to end that point, all assignments, all assignments, all resubmissions, everything is due August 28th at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Write it down. There are no extensions. There's nothing beyond that. The reason for this is because we have such turnover between the next class and moving forward, you can be late up until that point, but resubmissions, actual submissions, that final assignment are all at that point. If you get behind, if you want to reach out and have a conversation about what maybe we can do, happy to talk about it, but just please make that point in your uh, calendar. We talked about posting assignments. We talked about commenting. So when I used to teach in person, I had this uh, exercise that I would, I would ask people to do. And so I'm going to give it to you here. And, and if you'd like to do it, you can. So basically on a notebook, on one side of a notebook and on the other side, so kind of like find a notebook, or if you do this digitally, you, know, you can do two columns, you know, find a notebook, two pages. And on one side, and I usually do this in like the back of the notebook that I'm using, if I'm doing it um, in hard copy or if I'm doing it digitally, it'll go at the bottom. So on one side, we're going to write fire. And on the other side, we're going to write compost, fire and compost. So on one side, we do fire. And the other side, we do compost. One side's fire, one side's compost. And what I would recommend is after each uh, lesson after each module, take time to critically think about what you just learned and try to discern out the 
the discrete components in that. So when you when you learn about climate survey, you're going to learn about a number of different ways of surveying climate and how to how to observe it yourself. If there's anything that really fires you up, if there's anything that really gets you excited, put it over on the fire side. And if there's anything that you're like, you know, I don't ever want to deal with that. Maybe you like doing this work and this gardening work, but you're not a great map maker and you actually don't like making maps. Or maybe as we get into composting, you like composting, but you think the idea of composting human feces and urine is disgusting and you never want to think about it again. Put it into the compost side. Now, the reason for this is that this is a great way by the end of the course to have a whole list of amazing aspects and interests and concepts and techniques that you can then dive into further. A PDC is like a big buffet. You're walking down the buffet and you're getting a little bit of climate, a little bit of trees and a little bit of small scale agriculture and a little bit of large scale agriculture. And by the end of it, you have a sense of what you like and what you didn't like, but only if you actively ask yourself, what do I like? And then at the end, so if you do this, this is a bit of a cliffhanger, on our very final office hour, which is like the week before the 28th, I think it's like the 21st, um, We'll go over this and we'll, we'll talk about asking three specific questions about everything on the fire side. So little cliffhanger for everybody getting to the end. Okay, I'm just going to check the chat. Uh, can you please share your email? Absolutely. So I'm just going to put this into the chat here, Javin, at allpointsdesign.ca. And I believe, I'm just going to check, it's also in the discussion group specifically on the office hours. I'm just going to check that, make sure. And if not, I'm going to put it in. Nope, it isn't. So I'm just going to put that in now. Put it right at the bottom. If you have any questions, please email me at javin at allpointsdesign.ca. Cool. So now that's also in the discussion page. Okay, let's take let's talk a little bit about the question and answer doc before we move on here. Oh, actually, I wanted to check and see if there was. In wetlands, can you grow top cattails? Absolutely. There's a lot of edible plants you can grow in the wetlands. Yeah. Uh, Bakarishna, I'm from Nepal. Due to huge diversity in geography, it's very difficult to get relevant climatic information. Today, I've been using closest weather station, but I feel that they are away from the actual site. What do you recommend? Yeah, great question. So. In the climate survey uh, section and the tutorials, there's a couple of good resources. One is one called one's called WeatherSpark. One's called uh, Metro Blue, and then of course there's the there's the the major conversations from like Wikipedia and whatnot. And the reason why I'm giving you a, a gross or a general aspect of climate is because microclimates can be so wildly different. So in a place where you should be able to grow peaches, a friend of mine, because they're south facing, can, because they're backed by rocks. So the data we pull for the surveys and for the portfolio are just the starting point. Everything we do has to be ground truth. That is, we have to go to ground, we have to go onto the site and actually start to pull data from the site itself. So this means if you're if you have the financial means, getting a, a small personal weather station. Or using, which is what I've done for a long time, just having simple rain gauges and temperature gauges, and then just taking notes and having something like a windsock or a wind gauge, and then just taking data points throughout the year. So that way I start to build my own climatic record of my site. This is so useful if you're going to be on a site for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Generally, if we're designing, or if I'm designing, I'll have anywhere from a six to a nine month um, process of designing for a feasibility study. And then usually the design is very quick. It's like a couple of months and I'm done. The reason for that is I like taking a long time. I like thinking about what I'm thinking about. I like visiting the site a lot. This may not be your schedule. Um, there's a lot of designers who will design remotely, give them the design and say, good luck. You just have to be honest with people about the accuracy and the relative nature of that when you are designing. Because designing by remote is designing off of all this data. And it's accurate until it's not until you're you're on site you really don't know what you're looking at you don't know what it means so what i would say um balkrishna is uh use that weather station if that's the closest one but make sure to put down how far away it is it in terms of xy and how far away is it in terms of 
uh, your Z. So what's the altitude distance and what's the, the relative distance of it? And then be conscientious is that if you're on the lee side of a mountain, if you're close to a body of water, be it a lake or an ocean or a stream, all of those will have effects. So this is the beginning point. And when we're doing things like designing rainwater systems, those averages give us a sense of designing for scope and scale, but it's always going to be different on every person's uh, every person's place. But thanks for the question. That's great. So actually, I'm going to use your question now to make my point about how to ask a question. And you can put them in the chat, but in between sessions, this is a great place to, if you have a question, you can go to the Q&A document and you can write your question down. Now, the great thing about putting them down early is that the earlier you put them down, the more chance I have to do some precognition about um, about the site and thinking about the site and working with the site. So the earlier is better for me because I can pull resources and things of that nature. So what that looks like is, if we're gonna go to the Q&A doc here, and you can see at the top, we'll just kind of run through the Q&A doc. So at the top, we've got title, we've got the meeting login, just be careful about what you do in this doc uh, because you are editing things for other people. And so I had to pull out my name. Somebody had copied my name in between the meeting ID. So just be conscientious. This is a nice repository I made of um, previous uh, office hours um, up here. So this is the previous office hours of the, the recent um, courses. And so if you see something you're interested in, like, oh, intro to iPad design, I want to learn about that, or shelter belts, or concept design for horses, because you have horses, or hedgerow plant selection. Now, if there's anything here that, that catches your eye, feel free to click on the video. And most of these videos have uh, chapters. So, yeah, so most of these will have a uh, question, so what the question is, and then you can go directly to where uh, that question begins. So great way to uh, jump into a question or a conversation and go through anything. So you may also want to look through this as well. I'm just going to go back to our Q&A. And then if you want to ask a question, this is how I recommend doing it. So we've got Richard. So Richard bolded his name and he had a link to his project. So his portfolio. And then link to the slide in question if it's something that's referencing your site. And that allows me to go right there and to, to talk about what it is. So Richard, the question was, I heard you mention Hoover culture. I watch some videos. I have a lot of Ponderosa pine. So he asked about this. You'll also see here that Richard did what's called bolded highlighting. This is something I highly recommend uh, in your design portfolio and in your questions. And just generally, if you're working with other people, helping them to get to the heart of the matter. So I started doing this probably like six, seven years ago in my portfolio work. And uh, clients love it. They love being able to get right to the meat of it. So you'll hear me, if I don't see it in your site, you'll hear me say, yeah, you can use some bolded highlighting here. You'll just find that for your classmates and for me, the instructor uh, and grader, you'll have an opportunity just to get to right to the heart of the matter. Um, so this, uh, these are resources that have been requested by previous students that I've included here for your interest. So this is a master resource I've developed over 15 years. And it has a number of different resources, resources, be they videos or books or um, uh, 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 websites. Um, and they're all categorized by different major headings and categories. So if you want to take a look at that, you're welcome to. And then people ask a lot about plant ID. How do I ID this plant? And all I can say is it takes time to learn how to ID plants. There's a number of different apps that are quite good. Um, Picture This and Google Lens are the two that I've been enjoying. Um, but there's also some great subgroups of digital subgroups um, on Reddit that I really enjoy. And there's a couple on Facebook as well. And generally, if you post a plant and say, you know, this is where I found it, and here's a, a scale size or ruler or something to give it some, some scale size, uh, you usually get a response within a day or two. And so Whenever I'm in a new place, I'm learning plants, I'm working with uh, these, uh, these resources, or I will pick up what's called a dichotomous key, which is a, usually a book put out by a local nature group or a conservancy group or biology group. Uh, and it helps you to go through and understand and to uh, identify that plant. 
A couple of books that people have asked about before, you can take a look at here. Uh, and then a video that I recently did with a colleague. And then there's some courses. So these are some courses that were recently completed that I've been working on. And there's some courses coming up about propagating and uh, rainwater harvesting that uh, you may be interested in. But you'll just see that I'll put things there from time to time. So using uh, this question we just took. So I took this from Zoom. So basically, I would bold this. Um, well, Krishna already said that he's from Nepal, but I would put it up here anyways. And that would be it. Uh, so there would be the question. It would be in here. And then I would be able to come in and usually I'll throw my name in bold and then I'll start to answer the question and then we'll do it live as well. So for questions coming up in two weeks, you feel free to put it under April 24th and just like this. I'm just going to check the chat. Looks like somebody's posted. Is the portfolio the only product for revision? The portfolio, the only product for revision. Um, Mati, what do you mean by that uh, in terms of the only product for revision? And feel free to unmute yourself if you like. Or you can type out your, your response if you like. Portfolio, the only product for revision. I'm going to muse on this a bit, uh, unless you uh, reply, maybe you stepped away. Um, I mean, it's the only thing to be qualified. Yes. Graded? Yes. Yeah, so the portfolio is the only thing that I, I grade. Yep. And so if there's a question or a comment there, or I have something that I've seen that isn't there, then then that's what you would be revising. Great question. Awesome. Okay, well, that's the end of what I had to talk about. Uh, any further questions, comments, queries, quotations from anybody else? Anything under the sun, either about my background or what the what you could expect in the course? Maybe a worry or a fear about the course that you want to put out into the open, so we can start to chat about that. We've got roughly twenty minutes before the end, or we can close early. That's also fine. And feel free to unmute if you just want to ask your question. You don't have to put it into the Q&A doc or into the zone. Yes, I am. I'm uh, I actually right now I'm in uh, Cuenca, but I live just northeast from here in a place called Paute. Yeah, happy to talk about species. Yeah, um, the tropics are are a great spot. Uh, there's a there's a really great resource, and up until um, up until a while ago, uh, it uh, it was developed and worked with with um, Daniel Housley and Paula Westmoreland. You'll find it in assignment nineteen. It's called the Natural Capital Plat Database, and it's phenomenal. That along with the uh, the uh, plants for a future both are really good resources for finding and working with plants is it compulsory to ask questions just in chat no no you feel free to unmute yourself said that's fine any recommendations of groups for plant identification yeah i would say that uh, those two groups those digital groups i put into the q a doc um, both of those would be a, a good place to go to and then also just reaching out and looking on things like Reddit or Facebook, and then just typing in plants or growing or gardening and your region. You know, you can start with your country or go into the province or the state or the region and the county um, and come all the way down to as granular as you can. There's um, When I landed in Ecuador, I found two or three really great groups. There was a, a growing in Ecuador group, and then there was a tropical plants um, group and then there was a permaculture ecuadorian permaculture group outside of the english-speaking world south america is the the uh, most interested in in permaculture down here so there's lots of different groups to connect with saeed did you want to ask a question on mute i'm happy to to answer any question you have
All right. Well, if there's no other questions, folks, I'm really looking forward to going through these 20 weeks with you. Um, and uh, yeah, it's great, great pleasure to have more people interested in, in permaculture. Um, while I've, I've said it's just a tool in my toolbox, it is a lot more than that. And generally, the people I meet in permaculture are some of the most progressive, awake, aware, pragmatic people. Um, I would say my long-term friendships have all come out of permaculture courses or collaborations. And one of the reasons I created Regenerative Living Dot Online was I wanted to continue to uh, connect with the friendships that I have. If anybody's um, a solopreneur, an entrepreneur that's only yourself, uh, it can be a little lonely. So it's nice to reach out, make ecosystems and connections and conversations. So, oh, we've got a question. So you'd, how can we get ideas from your success stories and how can we be in touch with you? Yeah, so um, how can you get ideas from my success stories? Feel free to ask. And if you're looking for something specific, I'm happy to share it either from a business standpoint or developing a business or working with clients or um, anything. Yeah, feel free to ask about anything. If you go through my website, allpointsdesign.ca, put that into the chat as well. There's, uh, I've got a pretty good collection of portfolio pieces, allpointsdesign.ca slash, I think it's called portfolio. I don't think I've ever typed that in. I'm going to check that. Let's see if that works. See if past Javin was intelligent and titled it. Oh, no, that's not correct. All right. So when I click on portfolio, what's the, oh, I called it projects. Good. I called it differently. So there you go. Um, so you can take a look at those. And if you have any questions about those or scale or scope or size, um, one of the things that I think I, is unique in what I do is a lot of people in this field like to be insular. And I like to reach out to a lot of people. So I've had opportunities to teach courses and design work internationally. I've also had a chance to do projects internationally um, and I've really enjoyed it. I've also worked at large and small scales. So um, being in touch with me. So there's a couple of ways in terms of projects specifically. So at the end of each of the templates uh, or the end of each of the week's assignment on the template, you'll see that there is a Q&A slide. I'm going to bring it up here. So this is slide 14. So if there's something specific about your assignment that you want direct feedback on after you've submitted, you can put in your question here. And it can be as long or as short as you want. Uh, and basically, I'll give you direct feedback. I'll answer your question live as I'm doing video feedback. The other way to do this is when you're submitting. So we'll go to a previous class here. I think because the internet is rather slow, taking a moment. There we go. So if you're submitting and you've got an assignment that you've submitted, so you'll see here, um, student submitted. Uh, every once in a while, somebody will ask a question um, or they'll they'll talk about fixing the issue or putting in the, the element there. So there's an opportunity here to ask me questions as well. And then uh, ultimately, um, you can always ask questions on the Q&A uh, document that I just sent out and is under the office Zoom hours. Um, or if there's something pressing that feels like if you don't get it answered right away, you can email me. Email tends to take a lot longer only because I do have a full workload. Um, but if it is something pressing, I can usually get to it pretty quickly. So those are great ways to get in touch. And again, if you came in late, um, if you're really struggling with something or you're, you you want to go into depth, I had a South American student or South African student last year. Um, and we had a couple of Zoom chats because he was really having a hard time understanding the water flow in the site. So we had a couple of great Zoom chats and worked out his design. So yeah, those are great ways to connect with me. Uh, Maddie, I have a creek in my project and client would like to vert it to create a natural pond. Is that a sustainable concept according to permaculture? That's a great question. So there is a wonderful reply in permaculture called it depends. And it, we, we toss it around jokingly because there is such a scope and scale. So recently I was asked to teach uh, key line design up north in northern uh, Canada. And I went up there and they said, also, would you mind designing with the farmers? Like after the 
the talk, could you design their farms? I was like, no, that's a, that's a multi-month process. And there's lots of inputs to understand that. But what I said is I could be curious about things. And so when they sat down with me, I asked them to bring a map and I was curious about different elements within their site. And that's what I did. I had some curiosity. So for a question like yours, there's, there's an element there about curiosities, which is what is the watershed, which is the total amount of capture that feeds that one creek? Um, what are the water pressures on that watershed? What is the area or volume that you are trying to fill in that natural pond? And before that, why do they want a natural pond? What, what is the thing that is, is the why that's driving them? Is it just purely aesthetics? They want a pond for a pond's sake. Is it they're wanting a natural swimming pool? Is it they've heard that storing water is good? Um, so all of these all of these aspects have questions and conversations. Generally, taking water from a generally taking water from a surface flow of some way, shape, or form. So it could be a creek, could be a stream, could be a river. Um, depending where you are in the world, is usually regulated by some sort of environmental body. So in British Columbia and Canada, we had what's called the Water Sustainability Act. And basically, if a creek or water body was named, if it was named in any way, shape, or form, if somebody had just ever called it, this is Susan's Creek, um, it was under legal protection, and you could not take water from it. And you had to apply for a water allowance to do so. And the general thinking of this is smart. We have to protect this water asset. This water asset needs to be in landscape and being used. The problem with a lot of these regulations is they don't recognize that the majority of our landscapes are anywhere between 30 to 40% water. So that might mean flowing water, or that may mean a waterland hybrid, like a wetland or a marsh or a fen. And the majority of what humans have done over our span of industrialization and agriculture, which is anywhere from 12 to 14,000 years, is we've dehydrated our landscapes. We've removed the water from the landscape. And this, in part, has put a lot of water into the atmosphere. This is something that's not talked about all that much. There's a, an, an overarching... Uh, do I want to say that? Yeah. There is too much focus that's put on carbon. Um, water is, is responsible for upwards of 80 to 90% of the thermodynamics of our planet. And we put a lot of it into the atmosphere because we've either dehydrated our landscape or we've created our landscape that can't hold on to water. Brad Lancaster calls this the drain age. So drainage instead of the retain age, re retainage, right? Instead of retaining that water in our landscapes and having water bodies around us, we're putting it into atmosphere. So in your pond situation, and I'll do this a lot. This is how I explain things. I give you the big concept, and then I try to draw it down, patterns to details, draw it down to your conversation. So that way, hopefully, the next time, um, you can think through the question yourself and kind of come with your concepts and, and contemplate it. But with that natural pond idea, generally, you can pull water from a well, or pardon me, water from a stream, and it's not going to negatively affect the surrounding area because the benefit of having water impoundment, the benefit of having uh, flyover for migratory birds, the benefit of having uh, more hydration in this area can then allow for more life, more proliferation. And where there is more life, there is more water retention. So generally, it's not going to be a major issue. How that pond is made, how it works out, how it's stored, how it's shaped. When I went to Kenya, um, they had been making these amazing foodscapes for local schools for about seven years. But their pond making conversation was a little lacking. And when we went there, they would make these ponds that were about three and a half, four feet deep, meter and a half, they're about a meter to meter and a half. And problem is, is when you make a pond that's perfectly the same depth, you have what's called an evaporation pool. Basically, it all heats up at the same time and it all evaporates at the same time. So one of the things I introduced to them was having multi-depth pools, right? Having benches and having deep areas. And so you have deep columns of water that then resist evaporation by being cooler drawing uh, drawing water down and then having a little bit of circulation. So again, the question is, is it is it sustainable? Depends on you how you build it, depends how it comes in. So what I would say is as you're going throughout the portfolio, keep that in mind of the client has asked for a pond. I'm going to evaluate the site for its ability to potentially fill this pond. This is what we do uh, within our water calculations. 
And this is something that I've done from the beginning is due diligence. So if you have, you know, a hundred milliliters of rain a year, and the great thing about working in metric, sorry, anybody who's imperial, is that a millimeter of rain on a square meter of area is a liter of water. So if we have a sense of the area, we have a sense of the flow, we have a sense of how much of that water is actually translated in flow, because a lot of these surfaces will absorb water. So they have what's called a runoff coefficient, which we'll get into uh, in week, um, in a uh, lesson five or week 10. Then we know how much water is coming off and if we can capture it and store it and put it into this pond. And then we have to think about overflow. So anytime we catch and store water, be it a rain barrel, a bucket, a big cistern, a pond, a lake, it's really a drop in the bucket. You will be so surprised when you finally calculate how much water falls on your property, how much is, is, is actually there for you to capture. So everything's a drop in the bucket. And I'll say this now, and I'll say this in the middle of the class, and I'll say this during every single one of the times you talk about water. Where does the overflow go? Where does the overflow from your buckets, from your ponds, from your koi pond, from your swale, where does the overflow go? And is it put into productive use? Because it's a resource. Where there's water, there's life. So you want to put it into some place in this landscape. And I've, I've adopted this term. I don't know if it's a good one, but we make water prisons, right? On our landscapes, we want to hold as much water as is feasibly valuable. If there's too much water, could be issues. If your soil is clay and heavy, could be issues. If it's too close to uh, structure, could be issues. But generally, we want to store as much water as we can in the landscape. And we do that in both active earthworks. We do that in active rainwater harvesting and things like tanks. Um, and we also do that by increasing the organic matter of soil. So every percentage of organic matter that is increased, every 1% on an acre, is something to the order of 22,000 gallons or 88,000 liters. That's a lot of water. And for the price, in terms of increasing organic matter, it's always going to be cheaper to increase the organic matter of the soil than it is to move earth and create impoundment or buy plastic tanks. Generally, a plastic tank is about a buck, a buck 50 per liter. So what I would say is keep that in mind as you're going throughout the course, bring in the information that you need to. And then as you're going through, start to evaluate if it's a good idea, where it should go, how you would design it and um, keep checking in. It's a good question. Saeed, it were, it were a very fruitful season session, but I have basic knowledge before regarding permaculture, but it's much interesting subject. I have worked on soil biofertilizers, awesome, and soil microbes microbiology. So I think it will boost me a lot. And the course will polish my skills, excuse me, and give me broad ideas. I've received your reply that you're going to start another course in summer or winter on soil science. So I think I'll be there. Yeah. So really good colleague of mine, um, Joe Tobias of Root Shoot Soil uh, is, uh, is going to be running a course. We ran this course a couple of years ago called Working With and Understanding Living Soils. And if, and if you're not aware about the biological, the biological side of, of soils, um, Elaine Ingram did her uh, master's PhD, uh, her master's and her PhD research on understanding what were the living components around what's called the rhizosphere, which is the first couple of millimeters around a rootlet or a little tiny root, and found that there was bacteria, there was fungi, there was protozoa, uh, microarthropods, and nematodes, and there was this entire soil food web in the ground. And those types of microorganisms basically facilitated and move nutrition back and forth towards a plant. And as plants are taking in carbon dioxide and taking in solar radiation, they cleave off the carbon, they respire the O2 to the rest of life on the planet. And that carbon gets put into these long chain carbohydrates that all have a charge, all have an electric charge. And that charge actually attracts the bacteria and the fungi specific to what that plant needs. Because of the coevolution of the soil food web in the plant, it will attract the bacteria, attract the fungi that will be mining or will be accumulating the different resources, minerals, uh, and other elements that the plant needs. And what's amazing about this and what her, her research showed is that it attracts them but it's not bioavailable because you need predation. So you need those microarthropods, the nematodes and the protozoa to predate, to eat the bacteria and the fungi 
And then what's left over or defecated then is bioavailable to the plant. So there's this very in, in, intricate second by second call and response that plants are working with within that soil food web. And this is where my colleague, Joe Tobias, and my work within regenerative uh, agriculture and regenerative land design, we came together a couple of years ago when we offered this course. And Joe has been known to take bare, dry, desiccated land and turn it into lush and thriving because she works predominantly with the soil food web. Adding to that what I know about earthworks and about grazing schedules and things of that nature, you have this powerhouse that can regenerate and revitalize these areas. So thanks for bringing that up, uh, Saeed. I'm looking forward to that. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, not that you're welcome. Well, folks, it was a great pleasure to meet you. Uh, we've got 20 weeks to get to know each other and to ask questions and to come to these office hours if you like. Again, office hours are not uh, mandatory. Uh, if you don't show up, that's okay. Uh, you can ask questions without showing up. So you can ask a question saying, hey, I'm not going to be there, but here's what I'm thinking and here's my question and I'll answer it live and you can come back and replay it. Um, these will be up on the YouTube channel that's listed in the discussion page, as well as in the uh, previous student uh, previous student um, list, uh, previous student previous student office hours. There we go. Missed that one. Uh, usually within forty eight hours, sometimes seventy two. So you can always come back and view them. And we'll see you again in two weeks' time at about uh, same bad time, same bad channel. So thanks very much, everybody. It was a pleasure to meet you all. If you want to unmute and say goodbye. Uh, you can, and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.